breathing is something most of us take for granted, but not Tom Conlon. A swimming pool accident at the age of 33 left him paralyzed from the neck down. From that day on, every breath that he took was taken for him by a mechanical ventilator. But Tom has been liberated from that cumbersome apparatus. Tom, I'm going to take a look at your wires. He's the first person in the world to be fitted with a new device that electrically stimulates the breathing muscle from inside his body. With a few wires and batteries, he now breathes on his own. His life has changed dramatically. Pretty good. To know that I am the first in the world is very... Uh, I, I can't explain it. It's really... It's really something. It is really something. Tom's life changed in 1998. It was a hot evening. He and his girlfriend's kids went for a swim in the pool. The last thing I remember jumping into the pool was the kids setting their towels down on the uh, picnic table as I launched over the side. Put my hands down on my thighs and coasted across just like a dolphin, just as I always did. It was a fluke. <laughs> Cracked my neck. I, for what reason, I don't know. Tom was paralyzed from the neck down. Messages from his brain could no longer get through, including those that control breathing. Air had to be forced into his lungs through a hole in his throat, called a tracheostomy. His life hooked up to a ventilator had begun. Being on a ventilator leaves him vulnerable to infections and greatly reduces life expectancy as it bypasses the natural defenses of the nose and throat. The average life expectancy of a 40-year-old man on a ventilator is only 8 to 10 years. What's more, there are 13 places that could become disconnected, leaving him to suffocate if not reconnected in time. I could not breathe whatsoever, so there was that fear inside in your head, you know, that ink. Big time anxiety saying, if I pop off, you know, in three minutes, I'm going to be brain dead. So that was a big fear that I had. Okay. Tom's greatest frustration was that while connected to the ventilator, he was unable to talk normally. The only time I can talk is when it gives me a breath and the air goes around my vocal cords. So I don't like it. I don't like it at all. A team at the University Hospitals of Cleveland and Case Western Reserve University has been working to improve ventilator technology for more than two decades. There's a lot of research being done on trying to regenerate the spinal cord so that you could function completely normally. That, that type of research is years and years away. What we kind of isolated is what is one specific problem that we might help these patients with. And one way is how to get them off the ventilator. The key to breathing normally is the phrenic nerve. It's the nerve that connects the brain to the diaphragm, the dome-shaped muscle in the abdomen, largely responsible for enabling us to breathe. When it contracts, it creates a negative pressure in the chest cavity and air is sucked into the lungs. The phrenic nerve actually comes off your spinal cord. It's a little rhyme that we teach our medical students is three, four, and five keep the diaphragm alive. So C3, 4, and 5 is the branches for the phrenic nerve. It actually runs down your neck and right in the center of your chest. Uh, on the right, left-hand side, it goes on the outside of the heart, on the pericardium. On the right, it comes straight down along the spinal cord, deep in, in the, your back. So that actually get to these nerves requires a big operation in the chest. Tom broke the third vertebrae in his neck. Electrical signals from his brain could no longer get through. So far, the only alternative to the ventilator was to stimulate the phrenic nerve directly with electrodes, a highly invasive and risky open chest surgical procedure. Um, when you're actually dissecting out this tiny nerve, if you injure it in any way, the stimulation won't work, and then actually you're not a candidate for any type of stimulating devices anymore. Dr. Onda's breakthrough technique avoids the phrenic nerve and those risks altogether. The electrodes mimic the nerve, stimulating the diaphragm to contract. He implants them not in the nerve, but the diaphragm muscle itself. And to do this, he operates through tiny keyholes in the abdomen. He first locates the motor point, an area close to where the phrenic nerve enters the muscle. A small suction cup temporarily attaches an electrode to the diaphragm to test its response. 
and we had to go through a series of tests on each diaphragm. Here's another one. You can see we didn't get a good contraction here, so we knew that that was not a good spot. Once the most responsive part of the diaphragm muscle is located, a tiny hollow needle puts the permanent electrode into place. Now you can see we actually have the implant there. We checked it again before we left the operating room to make sure it was working, and we had good stimulation. Over the past few months, as his diaphragm muscle has regained strength, Tom has barely needed the old ventilator at all. The difference the new breathing device makes is dramatic. In through my nose and out through my mouth, you know, I figured out, wow, this is like back to normal again. Back to normal breathing, no ventilator, no hoses. And I said to myself, Tom, I think you made the right decision. Not only can he breathe on his own and speak normally, now that he can breathe through his mouth and nose, rather than through a hole in his throat, it also has restored his sense of smell. I go outside, I could smell the fresh grass cut, I can smell the flowers, uh, everything. Respiratory nurse Kathy Werner has helped yeah, look after good. Tom, both on the mechanical ventilator Nothing and better. on the new breathing yeah, device. A bit here. Well, to hopefully give him the confidence he needs uh, to move on from, from the tragedy that happened to begin with, move beyond it, gain the training he needs so that he can um, become part of the workforce again, which will also uh, boost his self-esteem and get him back uh, working with the rest of us. Freed from the ventilator, Tom's life is opening up. Using a headset and a mouthpiece, he's learning to work with computers. Being able to walk again may be a long way off, but at least it's a small step to regaining his freedom. Already, other patients are lining up to receive this device. It's the best decision that I've ever made in my life.